ecosystem connections, uh, which started first as a weekly meetup, and now as three, four variations. Sometimes we meet up to three times a week. This week we'll have two events. Um, after work, people uh, meet up. We put people on panels. Startups present. Uh, people get to connect with lots of uh, peers. And we have an approach that in business to be successful, you need kind of three important ingredients. And we call it MBC, which is like the TV station in Saudi Arabia. So M for money, B for brains, and C for contacts. Money comes and goes. Brains is the intellectual capital. And you can say the contacts is the business relationships, connections, wasta, and everything else that goes along with it. But I think that the connections is definitely the most important ingredient for uh, businesses and organizations uh, to succeed. Fantastic. Thanks. Nastia? <laughs> it's a small room, so I am not sure. Um, we are running PR marketing company helping to break into Web3. And um, like we do a lot of things like from zero to hero. Uh, we do have um, uh, like a uh, lot of things done for our uh, clients in terms of like uh, blockchain uh, development, in terms of uh, events management, in terms of like PR coverage in tier one, tier two media. So we do um, practically a lot of things to uh, get your place at this market um, like and events like apparently is a big part of it so I'm sure today we covered a lot of things and uh, my hope uh, you will like uh, all understand the value that event can bring to your business so I think that's all <laughs> hi everybody um, Jason um wear many hats. Uh, my day job is as the founder and CEO of a company called Utu, uh, U-T-U. Uh, it's actually the Swahili word for humanity, and we're building a decentralized trust infrastructure for Web3. I'm also one of the core instigators of ETH Safari, which just happened a couple weeks ago. It was the first Ethereum event in Africa. Uh, we had about about a thousand people across the different portions of the event, uh, remote and in person. Um, widely regarded as a very big success and looking forward to hosting the next ETH Safari next year at the coming annual event. I'm also an instigator of a few other ecosystem DAOs across East Africa, uh, the Africa DeFi Alliance, which is an industry association and open lending protocol uh, trying to push DeFi liquidity into real world African business loans across the continent, uh, as well as something called artstorm.nft, uh, which is an environment and social impact project using NFTs to transform uh, brown spaces in urban communities into green art spaces. Uh, so just generally a uh, passionate decentralist, caring a lot about uh, how these technologies can, can transform mostly Africa. Uh, I'm originally American, but living in Kenya for the last 10 years. So nice to be here. Thanks, Jason. That's really cool. So all of us have different geographical kind of expertise, I guess. So it would be interesting to know your guys' opinion on how um, in-person events affect, especially I would like to know your opinion, Jason, in Africa, how it's affecting the VC world and getting funding. If it's crucial, if it's not crucial, how you're seeing a change in that ecosystem, et cetera. It's hard. Um, we're 10 years into this industry, 12 years into this industry, and we've just now had the first Ethereum event on the continent. There was a small hackathon that happened in Cape Town in 2018, I think, uh, but otherwise there's been nothing. So you wonder, like, how do you actually meet people, right? If you think about all the conferences that you've been to and how much value you've gotten out of those, and then you think about here's a whole continent that is widely regarded as the place where crypto goes to win. And actually, the way ETH Safari started for me was I was on a conference tour last year, uh, ETH Lisbon, Token 2049, events here, and everywhere I went, everybody's talking Africa, 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 the place where crypto goes to win. And I'd get excited and I'd go talk to them. Oh, you're talking about Africa. Which projects are you in, are involved with? No, none. Well, which countries have you visited? No, none. Well, which projects are you excited about? I don't know. So you're just saying things to say them, mostly. So we wonder, like, where everybody's talking about the place where crypto finds utility because we have a billion unbanked or underbanked people. We have all of these things, but then nobody's going there. 
And I realized from that that there was basically a big gap in relationships uh, that was coming back to your trifecta, relationships and money. Okay, we have brains on the continent, fine, but we weren't getting the relationships with the global crypto industry and, we, and then the money wasn't flowing as a result of that. And I think we've already started to see some change in 2021 and in 2022. We've seen big investments happen uh, from global players into the continent and even from ETH Safari, uh, which is just about two weeks or three weeks ago, uh, I already know of three, four investment deals that have happened just out of that conference. Um, I think that role of building, it starts with relationships, right? There's no other way that money moves other than through relationships, especially in this industry. And so if you're not in the room, if there's no room to be in, how do you actually build those? Meanwhile, you had most Africans struggle to get a visa if for a conference in Europe, for a conference in the US or the travel costs. And so there was just this exclusion that was happening, not purposefully necessarily, but just sort of because. And I think starting to see uh, a wave of uh, events. There's gonna be ETH Lagos in Nigeria uh, later this year. There's gonna be an ETH event in Ghana later this year. So it's all starting to unfold now. And I think it spells a lot of good things for the continent. Uh, thank you. Like very interesting input. Uh, I would like to add probably uh, that we are working a lot of with Latam, and they experience the same. But they a little bit ahead of right now. They have lots of events happening here. But it's like even like three three years ago, it wasn't like this. So now you like probably heard about DevCon. Like there are also like huge events called Ola Metaverse. Like recently in. Uh, August, Katie was one of the uh, speakers here, um, but uh, and they are doing it so good. Like people are very, very talented people, very good projects. Like they need a little bit push, but uh, I I feel like it's it's going to be there. Like the next destination will be there, and like all this uh, presence at this event is like super important. Like uh, you need to create the ecosystem and the events one of the like platform that allows to do this. I also want to add that, of course, uh, like COVID has changed the world, and we can't deny it. <laughs> so, uh, before we really were like kind of like obsessed with events, and that like you should be having this like in-person meetings and all of this stuff, and like distant world create like created new rules. Like we were not allowed to go outside, so we we should stay in Zoom. We should like do these things in Zoom. Like now, like it's kind of like Web three is very like I can say flexible here we were distantly and globally decentralized everywhere I mean it's um, one one of the features of the industry itself but I mean so many things happening online too and like probably I just wanted to say that yeah there are like lots of uh, problems especially with visa I am also experiencing these problems too um, but I mean uh, you also can utilize lots of uh, online events that is like probably not so efficient as probably can be in person one, but uh, they also can bring you very good connections, uh, especially if you're working with a very like distant regions in like China, like Latam, and you need to travel like it's exhausting and you are kind of coming for event. You're spending so much time like to be able to like actually talk to people after the flights and all of this stuff. So sometimes jumping from Zoom to Zoom is much more efficient and you can do a lot of things here too. That just like to keep in mind that, yeah, like it's very important, but it's important that like uh, to uh, have other tools in your pocket. Well, I, I think we have seen massive change in what we are trying to do. I mean, in, especially if we look at blockchain uh, and the associated uh, technologies, DeFi, Web 3.0, and now a little bit of the metaverse, although it will take some time to materialize. We're trying to serve, actually, markets that are fairly large. So if you look at Africa, it's a one billion market. If you look at India, it's one billion. China, another billion. And then you have about 2 billion Muslims around the world with the biggest concentration being in Indonesia. So that really means you need to understand how to address. Uh, and today what we see is a birth of, a, you can say, not just physical events, but also hybrid events that have both physical and um, a virtual element. There's plenty of solutions. Some people are here actually in the audience today that have solutions that are both 2D and 3D so that 
it simulates in the virtual event very similar to the same experience that you have in a physical event. So you have the boots, you have the, the V cards, the, you can collect the brochures, and etc. However, of course, people still need this face-to-face -face contact. And that has to do a lot with the cultural elements. Like, for example, here in the Middle East, um, time is not as important as in places like Switzerland. Uh, people don't make decisions. They arrive at decisions. It's kind of a complicated thing to understand, but once you grasp it, it's very important because when you communicate with somebody, they never tell you no. But no may mean yes, no may mean maybe, or may, no may or yes may mean never. So it depends on how it's phrased. So and you'll only be able to realize that when you have the face-to-face -to -face element. The good thing, especially about Africa and the neighboring countries in India and Asia, is there's a lot of talent. You know, if you look at Africa, uh, I had the chance to visit 35 plus countries because of telecom, etc. Uh, even before blockchain, payments were already being done on mobile almost uh, 10 plus years ago. So Africa just created solutions that fit African problems. So sometimes we think that we can just bring one and it fits all. No, you have to adapt these uh, solutions to fit local problems. And the best people qualify to understand local problems as the local element. So you need to have that relationship to, to build proper solutions. And de definitely events is the place to create that community and that relationship to, to evolve to, to, to final solutions. Thanks, George. That's great. Um, yeah, and I think the other issue, too, what I noticed when I was in LATAM is that you have all these amazing projects happening, all this innovation, all of these communities, but you have so little VCs, local or international, that are making their appearance there. And so I wonder if you guys have your, uh, an opinion on how we can push venture capitalists and investors in general to understand that these emerging markets are where we need to be in terms of Web3 and how, how we connect these emerging markets with money. Because I was super impressed when I was in Colombia in August, yet there was this massive creator community, yet there was no investors there. And it was so hard. We did a, Nasty and I have a side event that we do that's around bringing inclusion into the space called WebShe. We could find so many people to come and speak, but it was so difficult to find VCs, which is so weird because the narrative is that everyone wants diversity, yet no one's giving money to it. So how do we do that? How do we push people there? I think, you know, it's, it's hard. Uh, when you're investing, you really want to invest close to home in a place that you understand, in people that you understand maybe in uh, something that has been vetted, you feel comfortable, you feel like you're there, you can add value. And for a lot of people, if they're not living in Nairobi, if they're not living in Lagos, how do you actually feel comfortable to make that investment? And I think uh, there's a couple things. One is you start to travel back and forth and you get a sense of the actual place. And once you've been there a few times, maybe you have a little bit less fear. There's also a rapidly growing local investment market, uh, right? That's not the case. That wasn't the case a while back. When I moved to Kenya uh, 10 years, 10 plus years ago, there were three VCs in East Africa, three, the whole of East Africa. There was Savannah Fund, it had just started in Arusha, Tanzania. There was something called Village Capital in Nairobi, uh, and there was one other impact investor uh, in Nairobi. Today, just in my neighborhood of Nairobi, I can probably name you 20 funds moving $2 billion with $2 billion of dry, ca uh, dry powder. Uh, I think within East Africa, we probably have 75, 80 local funds now. Uh, maybe they're not completely local, but they're uh, partnerships between a local investor, a local fund, a local firm, uh, a local manufacturer, you name it, and bringing in some external capital. And so I think there's a lot of co-investment models uh, that you can tie into, find a local investor who understands your thesis and be able to do deals together. And it's not a huge ecosystem. As much as it's big, uh, we're all pretty s tight knit. Uh, and so these are the ways you start to break in, at least uh, on the African continent. Uh, I think this is the best way for a foreign investor to come in, uh, find some basically local investors who can help you understand who's legitimate, who has a good reputation in the space. Uh, and again, a lot of this is gonna happen through uh, in-person events. And one of the things that we tried to do with Eat Safari at least, is create a very different atmosphere than say, 
uh, I don't know, ETH Denver or, or DevCon, uh, how do you do this? Like, well, first we took it outside the hotel. Uh, we had our event in a forest, uh, an old growth baobab forest with 200 year old baobab trees all around. Everybody's in shorts and flip flops. It's a very different environment from in a hotel buttoned up, right? And a lot more interaction, organic, real interactions. We took a train journey together. We put 400 people on the standard gauge railway from Nairobi to the coast of Kenya. So before the conference even started, we all took this long journey together. And there was a lot of bonding that happens. Those relationships, not just coming on stage and hearing my random comments about this or that, like uh, I think it's more holistic, organic experiences and building those relationships, making co-investments and moving from there. I want to be at this trip. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I want like to ask like you said very very cool things um, and what what we have experienced right now like with the beer market like uh, no one like <laughs> actually put money into projects <laughs> but um, like I do see the very very big potential as far as like market has this power of decentralization they still like there are so many like small funds there are so many like private investors they co-invest in projects and this is something that we are constantly thinking like uh, itself we are also thinking about setting up a fund uh, with Bob's Labs but uh, uh, just to help lots of our clients sometimes you just need like a little bit of cash to finish your KPIs and uh, to go to move forward and we feel like there is a lot of people who are ready to give money but you need to have like this like the good tools to like manage it who good tools to decide how to vet good projects and like how i like i was talking to probably like 20 small vcs in lisbon uh at new york one uh and they all said like we want someone big to like uh put their stamp here. We want someone to say this is approved because we are like small fund. We are like don't manage like so much money that we can like really throw it everywhere. We are careful about our investments. And uh, if someone like big can like show that they are approved this startup, we will invest. So we thought about, okay, we need some kind of vetting system. We need some kind of like, I don't know what is it like in terms of acceleration, in terms of whatever, but it should be s like, because it's so hard to navigate in this industry, it's like very dynamic and um, uh, people are lost in, in the information. Like it's uh, hard to, to actually uh, check every person, to check every background because there are so many ghosts here and there are scams and like you think, oh my God, like it's so dangerous to invest. <laughs> so we are thinking about how to make it more transparent, how to make it, uh, like this is like, I think the things need to be answered. Like it's, there, I have no answer right now, but I feel like this is something we should put some efforts to do. Oh. Yes, I think to some extent what we're trying to do is to build a better future and to build a better future uh, I don't know how to say it, but you, we are gamblers at the end of the day. Now, not necessarily gamblers in the casino, but I think the odds are sometimes not too much different, which means that if you go towards the very centralized VCs that exist around the world, that works very well for places like Europe or uh, North America, Canada, US. But when you go outside of these places, you have to have solutions that are more decentralized and solutions that are adapted to the local problems. So let me maybe just make some examples. So one example is doing capital funding using DeFi projects or DeFi protocols. So this allows you to have people which invest small amounts of money participate and create much larger pools. And for example, here in the Middle East, we have example of something that started kind of in a funny way and it was a funny name because people did not take it very seriously at the beginning, it's called Shisha Finance. Even when people look at it, Shisha Finance, you know, Shisha is just the thing, argili, ugly, bubbly, the thing you smoke when you network. But guess what? It's become a serious project, so now people look at it in a very different way. Another thing that I think is very important is not everything needs a VC, not everything needs DeFi, you have different models. For example, in Africa, and places even like Pakistan, 
microfinance is extremely important. Now, microfinance, of course, means different things for different people. So if you're in a gold industry, microfinance might be 2000 to $5,000 to allow you to get the necessary equipment. If you're in a place like Pakistan, microfinance might be $100. Um, there's an interesting project that got started quite some time ago called Akawat. You can go and visit. I don't know how to spell it too much, but if you come to me, I'll get you the right web website. He got nominated for almost the equivalent of a Nobel Prize Prize. And the idea was that if you have a business problem, we'll give you $100, and uh, you have two years to pay it back interest-free. This started as a very simple project, but guess what? They get close to a billion dollars that got disbursed out of these micro loans. Now, the interesting part about this project was not that the money got disbursed, is that 99.9 .9 something got returned back. So that means they were actually having a real impact, which is a little bit different than happens a lot in the crypto and the blockchain where people put money and they put things, but they expect maybe 98% to disappear and they hope to make a 1,000% on the remaining 2% so it's much more like closer to traditional gambling odds that you might have in a casino. So the idea is that I think we have to adapt the models to fit the local problems, whether those problems happen to be in Africa, Indonesia, uh, India, and other places. Now, there's all new generations that are happening in terms of getting access to qualified resources. So where you get qualified resources changes a lot. Uh, when I started in cybersecurity 22 years ago, we could get a PhD in Germany, and a PhD in Germany graduated was costing 12,000 euros. So what we did is we went to a place called Vietnam. Nobody really knew about it. And how much do you think a PhD in Vietnam was costing 15, 20 years ago? 1,200 euros. So we got 20 of them. And so, so you can do a lot more impact in, in the same amount of development. So sometimes you have to be a bit more creative. Okay, I'm not saying that Vietnam is as cheap as it used to be, but it's still even cheaper than India. And today you have all this globalization or access of resources with connectivity and events. So you can much more quickly deploy projects in a creative way than you could do uh, before. Thanks, George. Yeah, so I think um, every, our time is up for our panel, but I think the key takeaway is that the promise of Web3 allows, we're right at the beginning of it, um, we're still formulating kind of the narrative, and I think that basically we have to be looking towards emerging markets and localizing anything we do, that there's not one answer, you know, one size fits all. So this was a great panel. Thank you. Everyone brought something so different to this, and I look forward to connecting with you guys more after this, but uh, to learn more about Africa and all of the great things that George brings from his experience in this. So thanks, everyone.